I'm I'm Aubrey Evans. I'm the director of uh, the Birch Professional Learning Center at Branch Ed. Thank you for joining us. We are honored that each one of you is making the time to be with us here today, and we're going to get started quickly. I know that you're eager to hear from our presenter, Dr. Gregory Cajete. Before we begin, we do want to acknowledge the disruption in our lives and the increase in traumas caused by the global pandemic, by the events in Afghanistan, Hurricane Ida, and other things that may be weighing heavy on our minds today. Even though we can't see each other in this webinar format, we feel the connection that makes us a community, and that is to make the world a better place through education. And with that, I will briefly share the mission of Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity. It is our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs, or EPPs, at minority-serving institutions, or MSIs, as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today happens to be Branch Ed's fourth birthday, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate it. Thank you all for joining us on our birthday. Today is the first webinar in our 2021-2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert. Our hope is that you will walk away with an invigorated teaching philosophy and strategies that revolutionize your practice. Today's webinar is on American Indian education. Next, we have Humanizing Pedagogy with Dr. Maria Del Carmen Salazar on October 6th. These webinars are on the first Wednesday of every month, except for January. I'll send the link um, to, I'll share the link to our events page at the end of today's session. So now I will introduce today's presenter, Dr. Gregory Cajete. He's a Native American educator whose work is dedicated to honoring the foundations of Indigenous knowledge and education. Dr. Cajete is a Tewa Indian from Santa Clara Pueblo, New Mexico. He has lectured at colleges and universities all over the world. He worked in the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico for 21 years. While at the Institute, he served as Dean of the Center for Research and Cultural Exchange, Chair of Native American Studies and Professor of Ethnoscience. He is also the former Director of Native American Studies and an Emeritus Professor in the Division of Language, Literacy, and Sociocultural Studies and the College of Education at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Cajete has authored 10 books, 37 chapters, numerous articles, and over 300 national and international presentations. We are honored that Dr. Cajete is educating us today and opening the Branch Ed Innovative Pedagogies webinar series. Before I hand it over to Dr. Cajete, I want to invite all participants to please enter your questions in the Q&A box, and we will reserve the last 10 minutes of today's session um, for Dr. Cajete to answer your questions. And with that, I will stop sharing and I will pass it over to Dr. Cajete. Uh, well, uh, thank you for that uh, great introduction, uh, Aubrey. I really appreciate those, those words and those thoughts and perspectives. Uh, uh, and it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts on American Indian education with uh, all of you uh, as uh, fellow professionals uh, in the field. Uh, as Aubrey mentioned, I, I did uh, retire from the University of New Mexico uh, two summers ago and uh, have been doing actually quite a few things, you know, in, in lieu of, of uh, now being uh, deinstitutionalized, as I call it, uh, and working with uh, a variety of different kinds of projects, you know, in, in my retirement. So uh, today's webinar really is, is a pleasure for me and, 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 uh, and really, I think, gives uh, some perspective to uh, some of the things that are going on in 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 Indian education as a whole, but also uh, uh, what is happening in indigenous education worldwide. 
Um, just a few words of preface before I begin my presentation. Um, you know, Indigenous education has really begun to, to take on a life of its own. Uh, it, worldwide, Indigenous peoples are uh, really uh, making many kinds of uh, initiatives uh, with regard to education as a whole. Uh, the primary one of which is, is really what we would call indigenizing or indigenous forms of education into uh, either Western uh, educational context or really creating their own community schools. So there is a movement afoot, uh, you know, with regard to the indigenous world, you know, with regard to uh, exploring various dimensions of, of what we today call education. Uh, I want to emphasize that, uh, you know, I, I was uh, a professor in, in the College of Education, where my primary task was really to provide uh, expertise in American Indian education for uh, teacher educators, uh, which I think is a role that many of you are also playing uh, in your respective institutions. Uh, but outside of the Western academic context, uh, I also uh, was involved and is it, am involved with uh, uh, what we would call um, an indigenous movement, indigenous based movement, uh, to really actually reclaim our own traditional forms of education, uh, our forms of, of, uh, of uh, cultural exp uh, uh, expressions, you know, with regard to education as a whole. And so my first book, uh, Look to the Mountain, An Ecology of Indigenous Education, which was uh, largely based on my research uh, while I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, really uh, uh, began, I think, a process of uh, Native peoples exploring their own epistemologies uh, as the foundation for uh, their expression, their cultural expressions of education. So I just want to make that that uh, that uh, uh, that point uh, because there is Indian education as it occurs in schools and institutions of higher education, and there is uh, Native education as it occurs with tribes and communities. And so uh, what we're going to look at today is uh, perspectives in the classroom that I think are very important uh, for uh, both teacher educators and actually teachers themselves uh, to, to be aware of and to also give some uh, time in terms of their, their study and research uh, with regard to, to how to uh, approach uh, the teaching of uh, Native American students. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, begin to share my screen and I should have uh, started this beforehand, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go off and uh, open my, okay, I'm hoping all of you will be able to see that. Okay. Uh, so uh, the presentation uh, for this morning is uh, entitled uh, Key Considerations for American Indian Teachers, uh, American Indian Education. Uh, I do, uh, you know, make a caveat because of, of American Indian education because uh, uh, this would be slightly different. Let's say, for instance, if I were doing uh, something in, uh, uh, let's say, Taiwan, let's say Taiwan indigenous education, and, uh, which is extensive, uh, and uh, doing something with, uh, with the Taiwanese educators. So this is very specifically for American uh, educators. Um, uh, I should say that a lot of my work uh, is actually based on, on experience. I, I think uh, when I retired from the University of New Mexico, I had been a, a frontline teacher for about 46 years, uh, both at the Institute and also in uh, the College of Education and Native Studies at the University of New Mexico. So uh, many of the thoughts and perspectives that I'm sharing with you are based on uh, just an understanding of the breadth of uh, considerations uh, that you as uh, teacher educators or teachers need, need to be aware of. Um, one of the things I start with is, is the idea that uh, all of us as teachers are learners. And 
and if we keep that in mind that that we're constantly learning that there there are there's always something new to learn uh, as teachers uh, i think we begin to really open ourselves up for uh that 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 notion that we uh we are all learners uh, along with our students in the classroom uh learners uh, particularly in terms of the nature of cultural differences uh issues of oppression uh, bridging two worlds, native language and cultural issues uh, and ways of learning, uh, literacy uh, and native thought and empowerment. So these are some of the, the themes that you'll generally find uh, lots of the literature uh, referring to uh, as it pertains to American Indian education. Uh, I should say at this point that there's, there's quite a bit of material actually, you know, with regard to American uh, Indian education uh, coming from actually all over the world, but particularly uh, from the United States and Canada. And so I would really encourage you, you know, as, as you listen to uh, my presentation, that you begin to uh, augment your understanding by uh, really uh, taking a look at the literature uh, that's available, uh, which is always growing and always developing. Uh, so learning about American Indian education is what we really uh, are, are going to do this morning. And uh, just to begin that process, uh, I want to sort of begin uh, to take up that idea of the teacher as learner, uh, the teacher as a, uh, as a learning being along with their students, you know, as long with the presentations that they make in their classroom, the activities that they facilitate. Um, for me, the essence of cross-cultural learning is really the willingness of the teacher to learn about yourself first. Uh, students, community, and curriculum consistently and constantly. You know, as I said, the, the literature is always uh, changing. It's always updating. There's always research going on uh, with regard to Native American education, Native American learners. And so uh, as you keep abreast of that, you'll begin to see the, the, the trends and the changes of thought, uh, the introduction of new ideas and perspectives. Um, and also, you know, uh, taking the time uh, uh, as a learner, you know, as a teacher learner to uh, read about native, the native experience, uh, to read native histories, to need, read native autobiographies. Uh, to read about the kinds of issues that uh, Native people uh, are facing, uh, the challenges that they have, uh, the initiatives that they are, they are involved with uh, in, in the Indigenous world. Um, many times, uh, because uh, in terms of the United States, the uh, Native population is, I think, something around 2%. Uh, much of the media, much of the coverage of Native uh, issues is, is really almost non-existent in mainstream uh, media. So uh, you really actually do have to do some, some uh, uncovering of that information, you know, through your own research and through your own process of, of scholarship. Uh, you know, using uh, the internet. Uh, certainly there are a lot of materials available on the internet. I, I YouTube uh, videos that I think are uh, valuable, you know, in terms of uh, learning about indigenous uh, thought, indigenous peoples. So it's there, but you have to actually look for it. You have to uncover it. Uh, uh, so the feeling of caution when native people deal with teachers and school is, uh, has a history to itself. And uh, many times I've gotten comments from teachers that they feel that their students are reluctant to engage with them. And uh, th that's, that's true of, of uh, some Indian students that, uh, first of all, it, it's based on the notion of respect for the teacher. Uh, another notion is that uh, of experience, uh, experiences that they have had in school and with teachers as being negative. And so there's a tendency to be very quiet, uh, to be very, very withdrawn, uh, especially when uh, students are first introduced uh, to a teacher, a classroom, or a school. Uh, but that also has a history to it. The history is essentially the history of boarding schools, the history of, of uh, residential schools in Canada, 
and some of uh, the dire histories that uh, Native people have experienced within the context of Americanized uh, forms of education. Um, so uh, understanding that there is that sometimes reluctance on the part of students uh, and uh, Native uh, parents and Native communities to engage with uh, teachers and schools, uh, uh, just know that there's some reasons for that. Uh, but there are also some, some strategies to begin to address that as well. Uh, so working from a strategy of what uh, the student need is, is key. Uh, students' future connecting to their cultural background, uh, establishing pride uh, and self-esteem, and teaching skills that will help them succeed. Now, now, these are things that you would want for every student. But uh, it's particularly important, uh, you know, as, as strategies and themes for working with Native students. Uh, and again, it all falls within the rubric of uh, the teacher as learner. Um, one of the first things, one of the first themes uh, really is dealing with uh, an awareness of the community language and culture. Um, uh, again, Native uh, communities uh, have gone through various uh, levels of uh, assimilation, you know, i.e. through uh, through education, you know, through schools, uh, through, uh, you know, just participating and engaging with American society. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, Native people still view themselves as tribal peoples. Uh, they have connections to uh, to a homeland and, and to a community, uh, to a tribe, if you will. And uh, indeed, today, many uh, of our Native students are actually multi-tribal and multi-racial and multicultural. Uh, you know, as people uh, have engaged over these uh, past decades with uh, American culture, uh, American uh, Americanized uh, ways of living, uh, along with that comes uh, a lot, a lot of assimilation, you know, of different ways of knowing, different activities, and different kinds of, of ways of being in the world. Uh, but primarily, uh, I would say that you can still find, uh, and you can still uh, see, at least I can, in uh, most Native students, uh, you know, a, a connection to, to to tribe or tribes and to a tribe tribal history of some sort. And so that makes a very important uh, difference, I think, uh, between Native students and many other students is that uh, there is, is that deep tribal connection that, that still uh, uh, is with them. Um, I think the last statistics were something to the effect of 70% of Native students now attend public schools. Uh, I should say there are other uh, kinds of schools that Native students uh, participate in. Um, uh, one, of course, is uh, the, the system that has been in play for uh, two centuries now, and that's uh, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, uh, school system. Uh, uh, other systems include uh, various forms of parochial schools uh, that Native uh, kids participate in, and a few students actually do go to uh, private schools. But for the most part, Native uh, students uh, do attend uh, public schools. And uh, in that context, of course, they're, they're engaging with other cultural groups, other, uh, other ways of being, other histories. Uh, what's really telling uh, with uh, many Native students, as, as they have confided in me, is that they rarely see anything about themselves, uh, about their people's history about the history of Native people in, in what they're learning in public school. Uh, so that continues to be a, a major issue uh, within the context, representation of, of the cultural histories of Native people uh, in authentic ways. I, I wanna add the word authentic ways, uh, not, not the usual idealized or patronizing ways that many uh, students also complain about, but in authentic ways, authentic histories, honest histories of uh, people and place uh, that are indigenous. So uh, in that context, certainly cultural and language um, uh, 
continues and the, the cultural and language loss really continues an accelerated rate among Native American youth. Uh, I know th uh, that as I talk to tribal leaders across the country, uh, this, in terms of youth and education, uh, this continues to be one of their main concerns, you know, the loss of culture, the loss of language. Uh, because as I said before, Native peoples are tribal people and, and uh, uh, the, the culture and language is kind of the, the foundation of their identity, uh, of their sense of who they are uh, and, and who they are in the world. So that brings a lot of anxiety on the part, uh, certainly of parents and community, you know, with regard to uh, that culture loss, that language loss. Uh, now, I should say that a lot of tribes uh, on their own uh, initiatives, you know, have uh, created uh, language programs uh, and also cultural programs, you know, uh, to uh, engage youth in a variety of different kinds of uh, uh, tribal ways of knowing and also uh, tribal histories, uh, tribal language programs. And, and, and again, uh, this is... Uh, a priority among uh, really most tribes in the United States. Uh, sometimes the tribes are working with uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs schools that are, are that are situated on or adjacent to their reservations uh, in terms of providing resource and uh, content. Uh, but they also do interact with uh, public schools as they uh, as they interact with the public schools, you know, they bring forward their expertise, the history of the tribe, and uh, begin to try to address some of these kinds of uh, concerns with regard to culture and language loss. So I, I have to say, along with what what the school students are getting in, in terms of the school itself, sometimes that's being supplemented uh, by the tribe in a variety of different ways. Uh, through a variety of different initiatives, uh, through after school programs, through summer school programs, uh, and the like. But again, this really depends on the tribe's uh, capacity and research, you know, uh, or rather uh, resources to do so. Uh, another point that I think really has to, to come forward is the fact that uh, Native students uh, have a diversity and complexity of uh, learning styles. Uh, you know, there's there's been the tendency to uh, to sort of categorize uh, students as certain kinds of learning styles, being quiet, being very reflective, being, being you know oral orientation, and that is true, that is true, uh, but that uh, is not to exclude some of the other kinds of learning styles that uh, are also exhibited by students, because as I said. You know, as they engage, uh, as Native people engage in in um, multicultural communities, you know, they they also pick up uh, uh, you know ways of knowing, ways of being uh, that are coming from those communities as well. Uh, using students' creative strengths and orality to help them with literacy. So many students do experience. Uh, trouble uh, reading and writing in English. Uh, again, uh, it varies, you know, from individual student to individual student, but this is really based on the fact that uh, Native cultures and traditions are primarily oral cultures, oral traditions. Uh, knowledge is handed down, you know, through, uh, uh, through uh, elders, you know, using stories, using examples, using metaphors. And uh, so, so there is uh, also this, this tendency also occurs within the family where uh, instructions are given primarily orally. Uh, so there's a, there's a deep uh, investment in the oral tradition which continues uh, in most Native American communities and also in most Native American families. So uh, Using those strengths of hearing first, listening first, listening to stories, and then beginning to, to introduce the students to the written versions of, of uh, the story, let's say, you know, becomes a, a very important kind of technique. But nonetheless, that idea of, of orality is a very important consideration as, um, as, as, as you're working with Native students. 
so uh, again, you know, these are just some of the kinds of things that I think are very important as you think about Native students in, in this context. I didn't mean to do that. Actually, I'm still working on this. So, uh, you know, as we move forward into, into finding strategies as teachers and coaches that work with students or you as the teacher, the other thing is that, you know, I, I really would emphasize that, uh, you know, even for myself, coming from a uh, a uh, oral native tradition, you know, in, in my my community of Santa Clara Pueblo, that I uh, I I had to learn how to also work with uh, other tribes. Uh, this was especially my work at the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, because there are some variations in the way that uh, that orality is expressed with even within native communities. So for me, finding strategies uh, and approaches that work for students and for myself as the teacher was an important kind of uh, an approach because I also have a learning style. I also have a, a preference in terms of how to present information. And sometimes uh, that works for some students and sometimes that doesn't. Uh, so the idea of having multiple modes of presentation, multiple ways of teaching a lesson uh, became something that I had to learn um, and uh, I still learn today. Uh, one of the most powerful ideas is, uh, uh, it, one of the most powerful persons, I should say, in, in the whole educational system, especially if you're, you're a young native child, the authority figure is the teacher. So sometimes, uh, you know, and this again brings in the native, uh, orientation also for the affective nature of education. Sometimes the student learns for the teacher more than they learn for themselves. Again, I'll repeat that. Sometimes they learn for the teacher more for the more than learning for themselves. Because uh, what is what is also important in the native worldview is the concept of relationality. Relationship, relationship, relationship. And so um, Indigenous cultures do come from a relational worldview. And so the piece of relationship, relationship uh, to each other, relationship to the natural world, uh, relationships to people in authority, such as teachers, uh, becomes something that uh, students are well aware of. Um, and that also impact them. Uh, so harsh words, uh, uh, being put down, you know, by a teacher uh, actually has uh, a, a, a lot greater effect on many Native students than you would think. Uh, so that's something to really be aware of as you as you think through this process. Uh, taking the time necessary to research and learn about Indigenous culture and communities. So uh, that's one of the prime directives, I think, one of the first steps, and I mentioned this already that if uh, you're a teacher in a particular community, uh, you should first start by learning the history of that community, the history of, of uh, the experiences of the people within that community, uh, you know, as a, as a foundational uh, uh, cornerstone for some of the self-teaching that you would have to do as, as a teacher coming into that kind of a setting, that community setting. Uh, many times uh, teachers uh, coming from other districts or coming from uh, another state uh, into a native community uh, because they have themselves so little experience with native students or native communities uh, tend to make more mistakes <laughs> than successes, you know, in, in the beginning of their teaching. And if they would really have taken the time uh, to really research, you know, where they're teaching and, and and understand something of the community and the community dynamics, uh, they would have um, they would have had less less trouble, less less issues, you know, of uh, fitting in. So that that uh, goes without saying that you really have to take the time to, to uh, know your students, know your community. The other area is teachers' methods and behaviors. Uh, again, remember that affective dimension is very important. So affective uh, also includes behaviors, attitudes, 
uh, all of those kinds of things that, that we reflect as teachers uh, to our students. Uh, so uh, again, the first you know, element is uh, to build trust between yourself and the students, to get to know them, uh, to connect with uh, the community uh, in ways that you find possible, informal ways, uh, uh, as many as as well as uh, through school functions. Uh, establish cultural relevance in the curriculum. In other words, make it a priority in the context of uh, however and whatever you use in the curriculum. You know to bring forward uh, cultural relevance. Uh, so this this idea of establishing it as a priority becomes very important. Uh, tap into the intrinsic motivation for learning. So, uh, you know, uh, my work at the Institute of American Indian Arts, you know, uh, really, I think helped me tremendously, you know, as a, uh, as a teacher, young teacher. Uh, at that time, I was teaching um, a junior and senior high school in uh, science. And I had actually been asked by the director of uh, the Institute uh, to create a curriculum that integrated science with art, with the cultural perspectives of students that were attending the Institute at that time, which of course was a diversity of native students coming from throughout the United States, even Canada, and uh, uh, a diversity of social economic uh, kinds of uh, conditions, some coming directly off the reservation, coming from uh, their Pueblo communities or coming from uh, Navajo or Apache communities uh, coming uh, to school for the first time uh, outside of their community. Uh, other students, you know, being second and third generation, uh, urban uh, native people uh, coming from Chicago, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, Albuquerque, uh, all of the sites where you have large native uh, urban populations. So uh, I had a diversity of students, you know, uh, attending the institute, attending my classes, because science was required in the curriculum. Uh, but also the students were having tremendous issues, you know, relating to science the way it was taught, the standard way in which it was taught. And, uh, and so the, the, the director, whose name was Lloyd New, uh, asked me specifically as a young teacher, uh, uh, because he had observed me doing uh, student teaching with them and observed uh, a unit that I have presented on native uses of plants for food and medicine, uh, in which I brought in uh, art, in which I brought in uh, cultural uh, histories, in which I brought in uh, practical applications uh, of the plants themselves. And I also brought in the plants and recognition of the plants in the field. So all of those things were things that uh, really actually worked quite well with the students I was working with. Um, I should say that, uh, you know, I'm also, uh, uh, I, I trained first as a field biologist uh, with, a, with a specialty in plant ecology, uh, and also I'm a self-taught artist. So the, the curriculum itself was also a reflection of some of my background and my experiences and my understanding of, of how science was taught and uh, to me, uh, and how I had to adjust in so many different kinds of ways for uh, that cultural way in which, uh, that Western cultural way in which science was being taught and, and some of my own alienation, you know, with regard to that way of teaching. Uh, so, so that gives you an example, uh, you know, at a personal level that, that, that uh, this idea of building trust, connecting with community, uh, building on and uh, tapping into intrinsic uh, motivation of learning, so I knew that a lot of the students, you know, were artists. They were going to the Institute of American Indian Art because it was an art school, uh, Urban Affairs Art School. Um, uh, they were asking uh, the director, why do we have to learn science in an art school? You know, actually protesting, I should say, not just asking, protesting. Uh, so those were, those were real feelings, you know, um, but intrinsic motivation has to do with uh, what students are really interested in. Uh, culture, uh, their, their sense of identity, uh, their, um, uh, their intrinsic motivation related to art, you know, wanting to be art students, you know, all of those things come into play 
you know, as considerations as you're thinking about uh, how to teach and what to teach Native students. Uh, be effective and use uh, humor. You know, the idea of the act of, of uh, so Native people are great uh, joke tellers and people, Native people grow up with uh, within a context of humor for, for, you know, within their families and communities. And so, uh, so the use of humor or being humorous, you know, is actually a positive way to interact with many of the Native students. Um, and of course, uh, working with the family, helping them to understand uh, your needs as the teacher, you know, to, to help uh, the students uh, and also your need to learn as a teacher. So uh, providing students situations that yield success, uh, making personal connections to students, uh, using highly active uh, activity-based learning, uh, cooperative learning uh, role models, uh, being flexible, fair, and consistent. Uh, providing a real audience and real purpose uh, for students' work. So, so uh, this brings in the whole notion of uh, the practicality of what you're teaching to the students' lives. The, the relevancy uh, really has to be something built in. Um, and so, so uh, again, uh, you know, the teacher's behaviors and how you actually choreograph the curriculum and the content, you know, towards this end. I think becomes a very important uh, consideration as you, as you look at and as you think about uh, Native students. Uh, but again, uh, these methods, you know, work uh, very well for all students. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that for Native students, these work especially well. And so as you begin to explore you know, uh, how do you approach teaching Native students, you know, these, these are strategies that are very important to explore uh, in your own uh, behaviors and methods of teaching. Uh, recognizing the cultural gap between teacher and students, you know, for the most part, uh, I should say that, uh, you know, even though many, many of my generation, you know, uh, as Native people went into uh, college and, and received education degrees, um, there are actually, there isn't actually, uh, as you know, nationwide, a shortage of teachers uh, that is even more pronounced and critical with regard to native teachers teaching in native schools and communities. So for the most part, uh, uh, many of the students that, or many of the teachers that the students will encounter will actually be non-native. And uh, that also, uh, uh, is is uh, certainly going to be a cultural gap between the teacher and and, and the students. Uh, different beliefs, uh, customs, uh, you know, uh, this notion of harmony and balance, which is kind of the overall uh, expression of relationality as a worldview in Native uh, communities, becomes also something that uh, you, you you experience, you know. Uh, as a teacher interacting with Native students, the, the notion of, of harmony and balance being very important um, and the notion of relationship. So uh, in terms of ways of behaving, uh, eye contact, body language, attention, respect and being reserved, uh, uh, interference versus influence, uh, using different modes of inquiry, uh, the notion of uh, shame and competence, issues of time, uh, cultural privacy, uh, humor, uh, the concept of the family, because for many Native people, the family is not just uh, the nuclear family. It's, it's your aunts, your uncles, your, it's your grandma, it's your grandpa, it's your cousins, you know, so, th so, th so there's a, a much broader extended family that uh, that uh, is recognized as the influencers, you know, uh, among the native among native students. Uh, material possessions generally is is not something that you'll find extensive among uh, many native students, including some things as as computers, although that's changing. But uh, but uh, especially uh, in native communities that are uh, in uh, 
reservations, uh, the uh, access to, to bandwidth, you know, uh, the access to, to the internet uh, is sometimes spotty or sometimes non-existent at all. So all of these, you know, become a part of uh, considerations, oral traditions, which we've mentioned before. Uh, the idea of, of learning uh, through stories. Uh, I should say that uh, a native group has its, its complex of stories, stories that everyone knows, and stories that you hear uh, when you're very small, when you're very, you know, you're able to understand some of the language all the way through elderhood. And uh, each time the story is told, there's, there's a new understanding, a new perspective that comes into the story. Uh, because you're at a different age when you're hearing the same story, but you're hearing uh, the nuances of the story. And so, so uh, in the oral tradition, uh, there's a graduated way of understanding through the, through the process of storytelling uh, that is incorporated into orality uh, that many uh, tribes still actually do practice. Um, so eye contact, you know, the idea of, the, of direct eye contact is considered uh, among some students as a threat, other students it's not. But again, that, that depends on uh, the level of uh, assimilation that the student has gone through. But generally students don't look you, uh, native students don't look you directly in the eye um, unless they're angry. Uh, sometimes uh, you communicate through your body language uh, more than you communicate through the words that you say. Uh, the attention that you give uh, when it's appropriate, uh, but not spending over attention on students also, which would make them uneasy, uh, is something that you have to balance. Uh, uh, the interference versus influence. So sometimes when students are trying to do something, and trying to figure something out on their own, uh, the intervention on the part of a teacher is sometimes considered interference. And so you have to kind of understand the balance between those, those ways of being. You know, are you interfering with the student's learning or are you uh, try, just trying to influence? You know, uh, uh, this whole notion of shame and incompetence, one of the, the things that really does impact students is being shamed. Uh, and uh, or the perception of being shamed by the teacher or by other students. And so you can see an immediate impact on, uh, on, a, on a native student you know, those kinds of things are happening. Uh, in native life, uh, issues uh, of time. Uh, in native life, things happen when they need to happen and in their own time. Uh, so the idea of schedules or scheduling is it is is you know uh, a part of native thinking, but it's not as uh, as precise and not as binding uh, as it tends to be in uh, Western society. Uh, the idea of cultural privacy uh, comes from uh, just the nature of uh, of certain kinds of thoughts and perspectives are kept private. Uh, and uh, certain activities within a community are kept private and that should be respected. So uh, that again gives you something uh, of a sense of recognizing those cultural gaps that do exist between uh, teacher and students. Uh, challenges in seeing uh, these cultural differences, uh, the children's misunderstandings, the teacher's misunderstandings, the administration's misunderstandings uh, really can be alleviated by uh, just doing some homework, you know, with regard to some of these, these kinds of behaviors and, and these kinds of uh, components, I guess you would say, of the cultural gap. Uh, but again, I'll just move forward. Uh, one of the things that's really apparent is, is this idea of, uh, of relationship to American Indians. Uh, and I'm going to speed this up a little bit because I'm getting close to my time, I didn't realize. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that really is very, really important is really to, to, to teach a true history of Native life and, and conditions. Oppression, it's a relationship to American Indians, uh, oppression and its effects 
uh, institutional racism, overt, convert, uh, overt and covert racism, malfunctioning institutions, community and family issues. Uh, you first teach about this, but then you find ways to move beyond it. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, the teaching about the history of oppression is important uh, in working with Native students. Um, some of the challenges of the students themselves, uh, loss and strength of their culture, which continues, uh, effects of peer pressure, uh, identity confusion. Uh, multi, as I said, a lot of students are multiracial, multicultural, and multi-tribal. Uh, the importance of students being grounded in their culture, the research has found that the more a student is grounded in their sense of who they are, their history, their culture, their tradition, uh, the better they tend to do in school. So being Indian in a non-Indian world is a theme. Uh, of course, we have a lot of native language revitalization efforts going on both within schools and also within uh, tribes themselves. Uh, language ac acquisition, learning the language, le language loss, cultural and religious issues associated with language maintenance, urban and reservation setting of language learning, uh, English and tribal language use. Uh, these are all some of the kinds of issues that come forward in uh, native language uh, teaching and learning. And this is more specific to those schools that are very close to reservations and actually are attempting to working with the tribe, working with tribal members to incorporate some sort of a language program in their curriculum uh, for their students. Uh, but again, these would be some of the issues that one would uh, uh, look at uh, in terms of language revitalization. Uh, learning styles has, has come uh, very large and come full circle. We know that there is a lot of cultural influence on our learning. Uh, and, and that influences learning competence. Uh, we know that uh, cooperative and experiential learning works with many students, especially native students. Uh, visual learning, uh, oral learning, uh, personal and practical application, holistic and integrative learning are all learning areas, areas where native learning styles seem to flourish. And so the more that, uh, that you can incorporate this into your curriculum, into your content, uh, the better uh, chance you have of really addressing uh, native learning styles. Uh, again, I just wanna emphasize, I'm going through this very quickly because um, there's so much. I give a whole course and this, and of course in the course, I'm not able to even cover you know, a lot of this material, but we're looking at it in, in terms of the general view. Uh, many mainstream educational incentives do not work well with American Indian students. Uh, rewards, grades, going to college, uh, public praise or criticism, incentives must be intrinsic first and then move to the extrinsic. This is very important uh, because uh, many times there's a feeling that, uh, you know, that the students have these, these motivations, you know, in, in their mindset and they actually don't. You know, you have to actually begin with how does this impact who you are as a person and how does this impact who you are as a Native person? That becomes one of the first considerations that many students you know consider as they as they look at these these uh, these incentives that we, we throw at students many times uh, the need for self-determination uh, you know pa Pablo Freire you know uh, coined it as reading the world understanding the world acting on the world uh, you know uh, with a real audience a real purpose retaining and renewing culture interdisciplinary and thematic projects. So that idea of learning yourself through the things that you do uh, by uh, relevancy, uh, choice, real life relevancy, inquiry about the world and its issues, exploring and connecting to students' curiosity. Uh, students want to know how to help their communities many times and really looking at uh, them as, as whole persons, you know, that are capable of of uh, really uh, 
becoming involved with issues that matter to them and their and their community is, is very important and it's, it's good it's a good motivator uh, this is a big one responsiveness to teachers caring affective guidance along establishing uh, a safe environment clear and reasonable expectations small steps building confidence building feelings of social and uh, uh, of uh, cultural and social confidence, opportunities for self-expression, role models, creative teaching, and empath empathetic and affective assessment beyond testing. I'll say that again, empathetic and affective assessment beyond testing. Uh, again, all of these suggestions actually work well with all students, but uh, again, I'm saying that it especially works well with Native students as, as you incorporate these understandings into your development and into your strategies of teaching. So, um, finally, the, the level uh, or role of research, and we'll have about five minutes for questions. Uh, the, one of the most important things that I, I taught my students, and I, because I learned it myself, was to, to really understand the notion uh, on creation of creativity at a deep level, to, to, to understand that curriculum is founded on epistemologies, uh, that curriculum is founded on society and culture and the issues therein. The, the curriculum is founded on, on learning styles and the kinds of theories that really are important uh, that engage students in ways that uh, really impact them and impact their lives and have relevancy. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll leave confronting deeper issues like institutional hegemony, uh, teacher attitudes, community attitudes, and, and increasing parental involvement for maybe another webinar. But I really emphasize that uh, for the teacher, the most important site of, of self-learning, self-knowledge is in the creation of the curriculum and is in an in-depth research of, of how you create the curriculum in ways to address the needs of the students. So it's not, it's not for me the subject. The subject is very usually well, well laid out. Uh, it's really how you, how you convey the subject within the context of doing a curriculum and then implementing it that makes the difference uh, in terms of good teaching. So with that, I think I'm, I'm, I'm over my time. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask for maybe one or two questions. Aubrey, I'll bring it back to you. Okay, we do have three questions in the chat. The first question is from Matthew Henley. I would love to hear more about the idea of honest history. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness, honest history is honest history. I mean, uh, in many ways we know that uh, the history that usually is contained in our textbooks is only from one viewpoint and many times is actually censored. Uh, it does not include uh, the real events uh, that have happened. It certainly does not include the perspectives of, of uh, minority peoples in, in as actors in that history. And so that's what I mean by real history is, is really presenting all sides of a historical event in ways that allow the students to develop the critical thinking and also to really hear a, a truth that many times is left out of, of the textbook learning of, of history. And so that's what I would mean by, by honest history. There's numerous books um, uh, that have been written about uh, honest history, and, and so I'm, I would uh, recommend you know reading some of those books because they are there. And the other question. Okay, another question. Could you please? And this is from. Um, sorry, I don't see the whole name because my chat cut off. From Patricia, could you please clarify the difference between Native American tribes and nations? Uh. There, there is not really actually. Uh, the, uh, nations is a term that actually is a political term that came into use uh, primarily by the federal government as it referred to certain native groups and and 
and confederations because some tribes actually used to come together uh, and form confederations and, and that would be called a nation in the Western sense. So uh, the term nation many times is used as, uh, as a political term. Uh, I prefer using tribe because the tribe is is something that you can actually um, uh, you know find the history for uh, the term nation is 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 again uh, you know made up of a variety of different kinds of concepts and idea the nation state actually is a Western political concept and so uh, uh, native tribes have sometimes adopted that so they could communicate with uh, the federal government and state governments. Uh, but I, I would prefer the use of tribe. And, and so, the, the, so I guess that addresses that question. From Joan Finkelstein, you mentioned institutional hegemony and hegemonic messaging um, hidden in Western education and its epistemological assumptions. How can teachers dismantle these messages transparently to create decolonized curricula for all students? Uh, I think one of the best methods is, is really to use, uh, and I know it's come under some, some uh, criticism, you know, from some sectors of society, but, but actually to use uh, critical pedagogy. In, in the context of uh, creating. I know some of your, your presenters that will follow me uh, will actually talk about this more in depth, but uh, the critical pedagogy piece, I think has been very important in terms of uh, how you begin to explore, uh, first of all, honest history. And then secondly, some of the, the kinds of issues that, that Western epistemology, uh, and I have to say that Western education is all Western epistemology, and some will maybe debate this, but Western uh, education is a culturally based education. Uh, and it, because it's based on Western epistemologies. And so as, as you begin to explore epistemology, I would actually, for students in, in later grades, I would actually bring forward the whole notion of epistemology and how cultures, um, you know, and, and educational institutions and education forms actually stem from the epistemology of the culture in which they're situated. So uh, there are a lot of different and interesting ways uh, to teach, uh, you know, a critical kind of perspective of uh, to, to decolonize and to, uh, uh, to really look at uh, uh, one's uh, culture and one's society seriously and, and also very uh, um, honestly. And I think that uh, indeed is what many students are, are now asking for. They, they want honesty in terms of uh, how they are taught and how the histories that they are learning, you know, uh, are connected to other histories or how those histories are about one dimension of really multidimensional issues, multidimensional points in time. Um, I think the time was so short. Uh, I didn't realize I had gone so far. Uh, but in any case, I hope I've given you some real insights, uh, some basic insights into uh, working with Native students. Uh, so if you're a teacher educator, I hope these are things that you will begin to introduce to your teachers, prospective teachers uh, in your colleges in your institutions. Uh, if you're already a teacher, I hope these are some of the things that you will um, you will uh, in, encourage and you will actually approach you know, in your own research as a teacher, a learner. Uh, but in both cases, uh, I hope that uh, I've given you some insights that will help you, you know, in your work as a teacher. Teaching is one of the hardest professions, but it's also one of the most gratifying as we know. And uh, so I thank you for your, all of your work as teachers in whatever form that may have been and uh, will be in the future. So again, I thank you uh, for this time and for uh, your attention. We thank you, Dr. Kahete. And if you can see by the comments in the chat, everybody got so much from your presentation today and it was so wonderful and so helpful. I have put in the chat the link to our future events. Um, you can register for all of our fall events through that website. Um, and 
again, thank you so much, Dr. Cajete, and we hope to see everybody again for our next event. Have a great day. Bye-bye.